Welcome to the best place to be on a Tuesday morning, episode three. We have an exciting uh, list and line today. We have a guest who is an alum of the entrepreneurship program here at USF and is paving the way and provides a great uh, experience to what to think about or what it's like working for a startup and two different types of startups, maybe even the same industry, one with money, one without, understanding the value of research, what we need to do today to set us up for success. And I'd like to remind us a bit about the entrepreneurship program. And I would suggest that the entrepreneurship program has three main paths. One, of course, we're here to help you scale and, you know, the traditional path of building a business. But that's not all. Entrepreneurship and innovation is also tied to corporate development and corporate innovation, developing new products and services and push them to market. And many students to go work for small and medium sized companies as their product innovator, product development, product manager, et cetera. So being an entrepreneur and innovator internally. And I would say lastly, most importantly, the third path within the entrepreneurship and innovation program is empowering students to create the careers that you define, not that what others define like other major programs uh, traditionally do. Uh, the world has changed as we know we're in the new normal and those who create their own destiny, their own path and live their own dreams are the ones going to be the most fulfilled, change the world, and, and carve out their own path and not be defined by what others say. So with that, I'm here and I want to welcome our alum from, from the entrepreneurship program and the community, Lazar Anderson. So let's give Lazar a big round of applause. This is how we do it in sign language. <laughs> Lazar, the Zoom Thank you. team's floor is yours. Awesome. Well, it's uh, it's nice to meet everybody. Um, no pressure at all. Huge introduction. Thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, I, I think you said you know you wanted to kind of kick off with like what I've been up to since graduation. Yeah, and what, all that fill kind of us stuff. in because I know the last time uh, we talked, it was fascinating. I always learn a lot from you, and I know that the students can as well. So, what have you been up to since uh, you graduated? Yeah, absolutely. So I graduated back in 2014. And so it was actually during my last semester, um, I was a, basically a part-time student. I was just wrapping up two last classes at that point that I landed a job at a company called Kite Desk. Uh, I had met them through Tampa Bay Wave, which is a local incubator for tech startups where I'd interned for about a year prior. And Kite Desk was a company that was, um, at the time, building technology that helped B2B sales reps basically work more efficiently. Um, you know, it was a data aggregator. So if I'm like online and I see like, you know, Steve, for example, looks like the kind of person that I want to sell to, uh, added this cool technology that could like go on LinkedIn and like kind of crawl around and use different data providers, find like Steve's contact information and then port it over to my CRM. So I started there as employee number 12 and I was their first and only business development person. Um, which was like really kind of interesting. So it was like super startup stage. We had, you know, an MVP of the product and we were still trying to figure out like, who do we sell this to? What kind of market should we address? That kind of stuff. Um, stayed there for about two and a half years, went through a couple different roles at the company. Uh, things seemed to be going well. We landed like a series A funding and, you know, every quarter was our best quarter ever. And, you know, things seemed to be doing pretty good. Product was maturing. And uh, I got this weird email one night as like a Sunday night at like, I don't know, 10 o'clock, um, just saying, hey, let's have an all hands tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. It was like two sentences is all it said. And so like, you know, we're like texting back and forth in the group like, oh, shit, do you think like something happened? Do you think we got acquired? Whatever. Um, I hit traffic that morning. So I came in at probably 8.05. And I knew exactly what happened because as soon as I opened the door, everybody had this like solemn look on their face and a beer in their hand at 8.05 in the morning on a Monday. And um, basically what had happened was that over the weekend, the board had voted uh, not to further fund the company. And so we literally went under overnight. And so I opened the door and the first thing I hear is the CEO saying, and we're real sorry and we're working on your severance packages and like, that was it. Within like an hour and a half, the place I'd worked at for like two and a half years um, 
had was no longer a company. Um, it was still a really awesome experience. Like I got to see us grow from, you know, I came on as number 12 and I think we're like close to 40 employees when I left. And, you know, our sales had gone from like basically none to uh, a million a year in recurring revenue. So learned a lot from that experience. Uh, and then I got hired at one of our main competitors called Outreach. And Outreach was sort of the other side of the coin. So you know, it was this Seattle-based startup that Kite Desk was based at a, a Tampa. Um, you know, we they'd started at about the same time, but were much better funded. I think at that point they were up to like a Series C, closing their D round, and had like you know 50 million in the bank. I was to employee 200 and something. Um, so it was basically like a light years ahead, more mature version of the exact same product that I was you know used to working with and used to selling. Same market, all that kind of stuff. So. You know, total culture shock for me going from like a bootstrapping startup where, you know, we tried to figure everything out on our own to like a well-funded enterprise that has these vast resources um, that we could work with and stayed there for about a year. Um, cool experience. You know, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, before we started the recording, you know, I kind of had this itch my whole life to start my own thing. And, you know, I felt like selling sales technology was a really cool educational experience for me because I got to work with like VPs of sales of 500 person enterprises and we'd whiteboard out like what their whole process looked like and try to identify like, okay, here's where I think you have like leaks in your funnel and here's where I think like other opportunities for new markets might be, um, which is really cool stuff. But I wanted to do something a bit more meaningful to me. And so I started a uh, consulting company, I actually just got my notification that it's been one year on LinkedIn, so good times, um, back in October of last year. And then, um, you know, kind of met with a couple of different startups locally and ultimately found these guys called Thule. And they make an app for technicians in the field uh, to operate more efficiently. And so our focus is in the renewable energy space right now. So. I am like employee seven over here and basically the one man band heading up our revenue department. So all things sales, business development, all that come through me. Wonderful. It sounds like it's been quite a journey just in the past few years. And one thing that I like to highlight is the connection between what you learn or the skills and capabilities you learn in the classroom to what and applying them to what you're doing out in the field or in the several different jobs. So I'm, I'm wondering if, if the role of research has played uh, a role or how, because that's something that we regularly stress within definitely the higher up classes, being able to understand research, do research, synthesize it, because ultimately if you can't define the problem well, then you can't provide a solution well enough. And I'm just wondering if you have any experience at least with that or or any other skills or capabilities within the program that you see very being very useful in your current uh, journey? Yeah, so um, we'll talk about research and then um, like maybe the, the program as a, as a whole and kind of how I apply that. So research in particular, you know, when you're working at a startup, um, you have what we term sort of like runway, right? So if you've got a million dollars in funding and your monthly expenses are $100,000 you know, between employee salary, technology license, all that kind of stuff, you've got 10 months of runway until you are, you know, broke as a company, right? Because startups, by definition, um, typically tend to run off of investment and run at a loss. And so, you know, right now, I think in the company that I'm at, we're like really early stage. And what's absolutely critical because, you know, we've only got so much runway is that every decision that we make with the product is well researched and vetted. So, you know, one of the things that I saw earlier in my career um, that may have, you know, been kind of a hiccup for us at Kite Desk was we built out features within the product that we thought were going to be a good fit that made sense, but we didn't really test that assumption thoroughly. And what ended up happening was we ended up burning development cycles and, you know, people who write code don't come cheap um, for, you know, a couple of months to ultimately end up with a feature that fell flat when we introduced it into the market. And what happens with that is twofold. One, not only did you just burn precious dev time and runway, um, but two, you know, being at a startup, 
you're always looking at, or at least the you know sort of technology startups that I've been involved in, you're always looking at getting that sort of next round of funding, and that's all very merit based and based on you know what kind of sales you're able to meet and the numbers that you're able to show. And so when we introduced something that we thought was going to be a big hit and it wasn't meeting our expectations, we're not hitting the goals that we had set for ourselves. So when we go out to secure our next round of funding and extend that runway, uh, it becomes a huge problem if you know your sales aren't where they thought they were going to be. I mean, ultimately, what did us in the end was that the board had voted not to fund us any further. Um, we made some pivots within the product, and I think had we had started from an earlier point in the direction that we ultimately ended up going, their story could have been very different. But um, you know, that kind of is what it is. So, you know, for me in particular, um, whenever I'm heading up like a new sales initiative, looking at a market that we could tackle or something like that, um, I take a lot of things from like lean startup methodology and make sure that I dabble in the space, measure, record everything that we're doing see what the data says, and then let that determine the course of action. Otherwise, I'm gonna go way too far in one direction. And if it's not the right direction, and we didn't you know, make our educated yes correctly, then I'm gonna fall short on my projections and probably be getting out of a job. So um, as far as the things that I use from the entrepreneurship program, I think on a daily basis, I use the um, creative thinking principles. And so that could be, you know, sometimes you get those like formal whiteboard sessions with a facilitator and markers and all that stuff. And that's super fun too. Uh, but just the exchange of ideas and the way that those creative thinking principles, you know, teaches you to talk from simple things as like, yes, and, and asking concerns as questions and all that kind of stuff. Um, that makes you a very approachable person within an organization. Uh, especially at a startup where, you know, you've got a small group of people that need to solve a problem and not everybody has full fledged, you know, answers, but they might have really great ideas. So being able to combine that and work with each other on that, I think is absolutely critical. Um, pitching is something that I use every day. Uh, obviously I'm in sales, so right, I got to get in front of people and, you know, pitch a solution to a problem that I think they might have. Um, but Further than that, you know, pitching plays a role in, I think, just about every single person within the organization, whether it's our CEO pitching out and going for funding or whether it's somebody on the development team who's, you know, pitching that we should uh, pursue a certain avenue in the product. You know, the ability to communicate that effectively is critical. And I've seen some people that um, have done really well for themselves because they were able to challenge, you know, a group and pitch an idea that was well researched to say that we should move in this direction. Um, and the other thing, and I, I touched on a little bit earlier, is lean startup methodology is just baked into everything that we do. So being able to be data driven in your approach, being able to research, uh, you know, the direction that you want to go, let the data um, help make those decisions for you, and being able to iterate quickly is absolutely crucial. Wonderful. That's something that we stress, and I'm sure the students have gotten tired of me saying, go out and get the data, both primary and secondary, uh, synthesize it, find the metrics, dig down deeper, and this is just a start, um, and then constantly iterate. And while I don't teach directly lean startup principles uh, or lean startup methodology particularly, they're baked into a lot of the design thinking or the iterative process that the course uh, it has uh, in, in the structure. Um, but certainly the principles are there and um, they should be able to make these and connect these dots. One thing that I'm always curious to know, so you have experience both living within a startup, meaning, you, you know, What's it like in a startup? You know, you've roughly shared a little bit. Maybe you could share a little bit more, but also the life of trying to get your own side business and consulting up and running. And maybe you could share, is there some similarities or what type of mental strength and sustainability you need? What type of physical strength you need? What type of will and type of person do you need to be in order to, to deal with this daily grind of, of maybe it's not all champagne and caviar maybe you could speak to this type of experiences yeah um you know i think for me working at a startup just fits i'm not a guy that's built to go work at like a raymond james or something like that 
Um, I function really well in an environment where, you know, there, there's something just very honest about the work at, at a small company, right? You've got a handful of people that are, you know, we're all wearing multiple hats and we're all trying to solve the same problem. And there's not really room for anyone in that environment to, you know, be able to coast or anything like that. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword. I love it um, because I know that everyone that I'm working with is super dedicated to the problem that we're trying to solve and, you know, owns their own arena very well. Um, at the same time, you know, it also means that, like, I'm right now in charge of business development, sales, sales operations, our technology, you know, putting together the enablement stuff and making sure that we have the right messaging, uh, presenting in like demonstrations, and then thinking about like what happens once a customer onboards and all that kind of stuff. And then I also, you know, work with the product team and work with the marketing people and, and everything. So um, you have to be comfortable with like constantly switching gears and, you know, I don't know a lot about marketing, but I need to be productive in those conversations. So, you know, for me, it's um, I have my one arena that like I've gone super deep on as far as like what my experience is, um, but I still need to be able to contribute to those conversations. So, you know, it's a constant challenge to always be learning something new and, um, you know, never really letting yourself get comfortable that way. I think for starting up my own thing um, with the consulting business, you know, it basically, it was kind of ironic because what I wanted to do was focus more on like strategic decision-making and uh, the operations side of the house and get away from like maybe just being a, a sales rep with a daily quota, right? I kind of lived that life and wanted to try a new challenge. Um, starting up my own thing, I quickly came to realize I'm just going to be selling my own consulting business about half the time anyway. So you never really you know, stop pitching or stop presenting or stop selling something uh, in that regard. Um, it's been a fun ride for me. I just have a particular passion for like creating my own thing. And, you know, that's something that like I enjoy because I can wake up every single day and, and live and breathe it. And it's my thing. So um, whether it's, you know, immediately successful or we crash and burn and, you know, it took me about four or five months to find I think this first, um, you know, client that's been like a long term and it took me probably two, three months just to find like some short term work here and there. So it was definitely a hustle in the beginning. Um, had to rely, you know, a lot of my network and a lot on just taking a lot of shots out there and, and trying to find what would fit. So, um, you know, a lot of it comes with Kind of the things that we talked about earlier, um, getting in front of somebody and saying, hey, I'm some guy that's, you know, done sales methodology stuff for a couple of years. I think it could help your company doesn't really like it tends to fall flat. Right. But researching the company ahead, understanding where they're at, what their goals are, what their challenges are. Um, you know, I see that you're in a seed funding stage. You're trying to get to Series A. looks like you brought in a couple of customers right now. And I see that you guys are hiring a bunch of people probably need to formalize your process a lot more. That's where I found traction and where I was able to kind of get myself in is, you know, understanding who I was talking to, uh, researching them well, and then just tailoring everything I was doing to solving their problems. Yeah, I can. This ties to knowing your customer, knowing the problem, soliciting feedback, soliciting, you know, the discovery phase. That's part mm -hmm. of the design thinking methodology phase, right? The knowing your customer, the needs analysis, et cetera. So, we can see how the content we're learning in class directly applies uh, to this. I would like to prep the students. So I'm going to ask one more question to Lazar, and then I'm going to turn it over for Q&A for the students uh, if they have questions. And so just kind of, I'm you know, priming you guys. So think of a, a really good question for Lazar because he's spending a, a wonderful morning with us. So my question ties to a bit of one of the things that you mentioned. Two weeks ago, we had Nick Price in visiting us and he was telling us his journey and his um, his his career path since graduating. And I know you know Nick uh, and I hope to have a few more alumni coming through, but how important is networking or staying in touch with your colleagues and your former your former classmates? And how important is is that network today, tomorrow and in the future? Yeah, great question. So 
I think the value of like my time in the entrepreneurship program, um, the education was just one component of that. I think it breaks down into, you know, your education and learning, um, which doesn't end at the classroom, your experiences that you're able to get, and then your network. And so, you know, the one thing that I would stress as much as possible is, you know, go out and get as much experience as you can and start your career as early as possible. So if you're not interning already, go out and get an internship like as soon as possible. There are many startups out there that are, you know, needing remote talent right now. I know things are a little bit more difficult with COVID, but actually I think from the Tampa Bay area, it might be a bit of an advantage because a lot of people that typically used to bring people in house are now hiring remotely. And so, you know, when I was looking for an internship in the Tampa Bay area, there were only so many startups around. Um, now I think it's a lot easier to land something, you know, within the country. But I think interning as much as possible and trying to have a diversity of experiences is extremely important. That builds your resume and that builds out your story uh, and the experiences that you have that you can then leverage into, you know, whether that's going to be a full time position, whether that's, you know, going out and starting a company. Um, having some baselines and some experience to apply that to is hugely important. If I could redo it again, you know, I do an internship every semester from my freshman year, and I probably would have dropped out by the time I was a sophomore because I would have had like full-time job offers. Um, I think experience builds that story, and then your network is what connects you uh, to other people where that story becomes valuable. So I used to like passionately hate networking events. Um, you know, we've all seen those like you know, business professionals of Tampa Bay stuff. And I didn't really know what I was doing and I was kind of a shy kid anyway. So I'd like cash in my drink ticket, go talk to the two people I already knew and left and I didn't get a ton of value out of it. What I actually found out is that networking happens all the time. Um, it's a lot of dots that don't seem to necessarily connect in the moment, but go out and meet a ton of people and meet them anyway and have your story and connect with them and maintain that connection. So I can give you an example of, it's about five years ago, I went to South by Southwest in Austin. Um, I didn't actually have tickets to the conference. We just knew that there are a lot of like cool peripheral events in the city and, you know, a lot of like tech events and stuff like that. So me and a couple of friends went out there and, you know, just go to like different companies that are doing open houses or, um, you know, sometimes there's events at like open bars and things of that nature, a lot of fun met a lot of just random people from all walks of life. It was about 10 o'clock on a Saturday and a buddy of mine got a text that someone he knew was in town at some Microsoft event and could get us in. And um, turns out the guy was like this really cool, uh, you know, CTO who had like multiple companies that he'd worked for and, you know, had a few beers, stayed in touch, didn't think anything of it. Um, Six months ago, when I was looking at different consulting opportunities, he actually thought of me for the current company I'm at, and that's how I got the job that I'm at. So it's not always like, you know, my brother-in-law or like my best friend that I grew up with or somebody that I know really well. Um, actually, most of the opportunities that have come my way have been from people that I didn't know particularly well that you know, I didn't necessarily see as a valuable connection at the time, but made the connection, maintained the relationship. And there's just something inherent to human nature where, hey, we need somebody who knows how to do like marketing or something like that. Oh, I met somebody at a cocktail event, you know, a couple of weeks ago that seemed like an interesting person. Like our mind immediately goes to someone that we knew and values that over a pile of, you know, a thousand applications. I've never gotten a job from like an Indeed or anything like that. It's always been from some connection that I had. And it was always kind of funny that it wasn't a connection at the time that, you you know, walking away, I thought, well, this is going to get me an opportunity down the road. So critically important. Um, I was that kid at like every single conference, every single speaking event. Um, you know, if it was like a virtual session or something like that, I went to all of them. I was part of the entrepreneurship club. I just kind of went to everything and met everybody. And I think that's paid off a lot for me later. So I encourage doing that as much as possible, even if you're kind of shy like I am. Like, just go out and do it. The Tampa Bay tech community in particular and startup community is like so welcoming and easy to talk to. 
Um, and there's a lot of like very available resources and low hanging fruit. And there's a lot of things that you can take advantage of as a student that, um, you know, won't necessarily be opportunities for you when you graduate. So yeah, just get out there as much as possible. Wonderful. I would like to open the floor for questions from the students. Do any of the students uh, have any thoughts, comments, questions? Maybe unmute yourself or raise your hand. I can't see everyone, but yes, Cassidy. Well, um, I'm pretty interested because it sounds like you're working in the field of something that I would be interested in. Um, so could you tell us a little bit more about the company? Yeah, sure. Uh, the company is called Thule.ai, which is also our website if you want to check us out. Mm -hmm. And basically what we're building right now is similar to kind of, uh, have you ever used like uh, Slack, like the office app for chatting? No, I haven't. Basically it's, um, it's kind of a communication and collaboration tool for field technicians. So what we've seen is that like, there's, you know, everybody in the office right now is super connected and has all these different tools. And, you know, there's things that we can use to exchange information back and forth and collaborate with one another. And field technicians, for whatever reason, are a bit technologically left in the dust in that aspect, um, especially when we look at guys that like work on like wind turbines. You know, they're still very common that we'll see like a notebook of pen and paper stuff down tower. And, you know, there's been a huge increase in efficiency over the last 10 years or so of uh, the efficacy of, you know, wind power in general. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that has come from like Internet of Things and monitoring devices and all that. So what we see is the biggest opportunity is making how field technicians work together and collaborate more efficiently. So we built out a tool that allows them to chat with each other over a secure line, which doesn't sound like a novel piece of technology, um, but they're not allowed to do things like, you know, hop on like a, a group chat and send something as simple as like a, you know, picture of a broken turbine to somebody else and say, how do I fix this? Um, so we're giving them a secure platform to do actions like that, complete paperwork more efficiently, that sort of thing. So the end result is that uh, we end up saving time of about 30 minutes per day per technician for our users. And that has a real monetary value and an ROI that we can demonstrate, right? So if I'm saving your technician time, who is being paid, you know, $30, $40 an hour times your team of, you know, 40 people that you have working, there's a pretty obvious dollar value that comes from that. And also, you know, these assets that they're working on are, you know, multi-million dollar wind turbines that produce millions of dollars of power every year. So they're timed to the minute for like, if they're down or not operating, and there's a huge dollar cost to that downtime. So if we're able to trim that even a little bit, um, there's a really good argument from helping those guys work more efficiently. Okay. W wonderful. Um, two things I'd like to highlight, Lazar, that you mentioned. One, you talked about in internships. In fact, we worked together this earlier this summer, and I sent it out to the students in the management class that I was teaching at that time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anything uh, resulted, or if you'll have that in the future, but maybe certainly Cassidy should reconnect with Lazar, certainly on LinkedIn or, or even after this. Did that yeah, anything absolutely. transpire from the internship from, from summer? Yeah. So we brought on one intern from USF Tampa and one intern from USF St. Pete. Um, and I've been super impressed, uh, by the, the output that's been coming through. Um, you know, I used to work for companies that, uh, basically made technology for like junior sales reps and they're, you know, producing at a similar capacity of like college graduate full time job having, um, you know, been in the industry for a year people. So, you know, right now we're looking at ways that we can keep, you know, some of them on in like a, you know, employed capacity once their internship is completed. Wonderful. I, I'm happy to hear that that worked out. I don't know if that came from the the students from class, but nonetheless, you know, thanks for continuing to support our students and in, in USF. The other thing that you mentioned was the Internet of Things. Many of our students should be familiar with Internet of Things because, in fact, we have a project based off of the Internet of Things where they're trying to solve a social or uh, uh, society problem here in the Tampa Bay community using the Internet of Things and using the content of corporate innovation or organizational innovation to solve those. So 
Could you speak a bit more on the, the trend or the roles of Internet of Things and, and maybe how you see that going or, or why it's important to, to know and be aware of? Um, it's not my arena per se. I'm on the revenue side of the house because I'm not the most you know, technologically advanced guy. Um, what I can say is that in our particular industry, um, and if we look at you know just wind in particular, you know the viability of something like a wind turbine ten years ago, and if you look at the impact of you know it went from being less than half a percent of the power that's generated across the country to you know 10x that now in a short amount of time, uh, a lot of that has come from technologically advances in specifically how uh, all of these different components within a turbine are now alive and monitored and tracked and you know to the point that we have uh, I've seen you know these command stations and it's wicked cool where you know these guys have like Star Trek looking like knobs and dials and millions of other things and each one of those is relating to a specific component within the wind turbine that's now basically reporting on its own productivity to the point that somebody three states away can see that like, okay, the wind's blowing, yay so, and like this thing is a little bit off, so we're gonna rotate the turbine ever so slightly. We're gonna send a technician out automatically because we've noticed that there's a fault or you know something going on here um, where like that technology didn't previously exist a short time ago. So I think you know it's literally fundamentally changed the viability of our industry. Thank you for sharing that. Other questions from the floor, from the student? On mic and chair. So I know you said that you really enjoy working for like the startups and it's very fulfilling for you. Are mm -hmm. you interested in founding your own startup? Absolutely. So for me, you know, what I've been trying to do in my career is build up a better and better knowledge base so that I could come in as someone who's, um, you know, uh, a very qualified co-founder that could grow with the company. Um, and so what you'll see at a lot of organizations is, you know, they'll get a product out, an MVP, it gets some traction. And then once they hit a certain level of growth stage, they start to bring on, you know, other co-founders or other higher level executives um, within the company that are, you know, able to take them from, they've gone from here to there, and now we need someone different to take it from, you know, there to here. So what I'd like to do is really develop out my skill set so that I'm somebody that the company can grow and scale with. Um, you know, coming in as employee seven is pretty close um, to, you know, I was, I think there was three that co-founded it and then, you know, they brought on a handful of employees since. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, for me being able to understand the revenue side of the house so that I could pair with someone who is a technically minded co-founder um, and then, be able to pick and choose, you know, problems within a space that I'm passionate about. So, you know, I made the switch to renewable energy about six months ago and love it and want to learn more about it and could absolutely see myself, you know, after, uh, you know, hopefully I have a long ride with Thule and it's a successful company and, you know, many years from now we IPO and all that stuff. And then after that, yeah, I, I think it's where I fit in best. Thank okay, you. great. Thank you so much. Thank you. So final question, and I, I can't thank you enough for spending uh, Tuesday morning with us and sharing your experiences and inspiring me and, and hopefully others in, in this class. But I like to ask our guests this, if you could go back and give some words of wisdom to your younger self, if when you were in school or university or in the program, what advice or wisdom would you give your younger self? Um, you know, what would you share? Oof, how much time do you have? Um, <laughs> so, you know, to give you a bit of background, I didn't start off at USF St. Pete. Um, like most people there, I had an A traditional path at the school. And uh, I actually started off at University in North Florida. And, you know, I had this sort of almost anti-school attitude at the time. Um, you know, I would go to class when needed, um, you know, took some online classes, kind of, you know, did enough work to, 
uh, get by. We figured out pretty fast, you know, if it's a business class that has a McGraw-Hill textbook, anything that's bold, underlined, italicized, or bullet point is going to be on the exam. And so, you know, we'd scan the chapter and then fill out the Scantron, get my A minus and move on. Um, graduated from UNF with an associate's degree and absolutely nothing else to show for it, right? So I have like no network from my time there, um, really no valuable experiences that I put onto my resume. Uh, came to USF St. Pete and had a similar mindset to start, but it's a cool school and, you know, it's a smaller community and people have a way of just kind of bringing you in and ended up graduating with the complete opposite mindset of, you know, go out, do all of the things, intern, you know, as much as possible. I was like part of the entrepreneurship club and multiple other clubs on campus, um, you know, went to every conference I could. Uh, milk the system, by the way, you guys pay a lot in ANS fees and, you know, they'll send you out to like really cool conferences. Um, I don't know if the uh, entrepreneurship program you know, still has like a little bit of funding for like, we went out to the uh, SIPSI conference in Buffalo, the Creative Problem Solving Institute conference, one of the coolest experiences I ever had, you know, stuff that's like $5,000 a ticket, um, but there's student rates and the school pay for things. So, you know, take advantage of those resources as much as possible and just try to experience as many things as possible. You got to build out, you know, what your story is. So in turn, start something for the sake of starting something doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, uh, a company. You could start a food blog, start, you know, uh, I started a nonprofit with some friends, um, which is a really fun experience. Like just get your feet wet in as many ways as possible and meet as many people as possible and do it sooner than later. Uzar, this has been a wonderful 45 minutes with you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day. Uh, let's give Lazar a virtual round of applause. Thank you, guys. Uh, I hope to reach out to you to catch up again, but also to bring you back to class in the future. So thank you, and uh, thanks for inspiring us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for your time, guys. This has been fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.